into the future. So the, where OAuth started, where, where OAuth 2 started rather, is with this core document. So RFC 6749 is considered the sort of starting point of, of OAuth. That's what you'll start reading when you start finding and looking into these specs. This core document describes essentially a couple of different ways to get access tokens. So it's gonna to be things like um, these different OAuth flows. So the authorization code flow, the implicit flow. Um, and these describe various ways that apps can get an access token. Now the access token is the thing the app is gonna to use to go make an API request. What's uh, What sort of happened when this was coming out was uh, the way that access tokens a lot of the frustrations people had around OAuth 1 were in dealing with how to use those access tokens. It required a lot of cryptographic signing in your application code, which made it pretty hard to actually to actually uh, use on a regular basis and in lots of different environments. So the, one of the things that OAuth 2 did was simplify that into what we call bearer tokens. And the idea with a bearer token is that it is all that is required in order to make an API request. Basically, it's called a bearer token because whoever is holding the token can use it to make an API request. Now that does mean it's higher risk than using something like signed requests because if you steal a token, it can be used to make an API request as well. And there's no indication that it will have been stolen. So this was something that was, I would say, hotly debated around the time that OAuth was first created. and uh, OAuth 2 was was first created. And because it was debated so much, it actually ended up getting split out into a separate RFC. So bearer tokens are their own RFC because not everybody actually agreed that this was a good way to do it. However, it is, in fact, the way that most things continue to work today because it is so much simpler than any other method. And we'll get to more of that in a little bit. Um, this RFC about bearer tokens describes a few different ways of using bearer tokens, things like using it in an HTTP header or using it in the, po the um, post body of a, of a post request, also using it in a query string, which uh, one of these is a bad idea, it turns out. So this is sort of the origins of OAuth 2. And then when it was created, mobile apps and single page apps were still actually relatively new ideas and there wasn't a lot of maturity in those platforms so one of the but but they were they did exist obviously this is 2012 so this is several years after the iphone uh was first announced and one of the goals of oauth 2 was actually to have it be possible to use in these kinds of environments where oauth 1 really wasn't possible so some of the 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 flows in oauth 2 were created specifically for this purpose of being able to work in JavaScript apps, single page apps, and also mobile apps. But even then, uh, so the implicit flow was one of those, and even then the implicit flow was known that it was not the most secure option. It's just that it was sort of the only way to do it at the time. So these, these apps, these you know, single page apps and mobile apps, they have this particular problem where they can't actually use a client secret to protect uh, any requests that are made to the authorization server, for example. A client secret authenticates the app in a way that, um, you know, without it, you kind of never are really sure who's making the request, which app is making the request. So the implicit flow and the, um, and the alternative of the authorization code flow, just not using a client secret, those have a problem, which is that nothing's ever really sure that, this, that the flow actually was successful. I like to use this, this picture of um, sending data in in the front channel, which is how the implicit flow works uh, and how the authorization code flow returns that temporary authorization code. I like to imagine that it's kind of like throwing it over the wall, over a wall, where if you're throwing this, this either access token in the implicit flow or authorization code over a wall, you can't actually see if it's been received. And there's a similar problem on the other side. You can't actually tell where it's coming from. All you see is that something came over the wall. You can't tell if it's from who you actually think it's from. So this is just a fact that this is a problem with using, with sending data in this manner. So we have to work around that problem in various ways. So one of the ways to solve this is by using this extension called Pixie. So a few years after OAuth 2 was first published, Pixie was, was developed uh, specifically for mobile apps to be able to use the authorization code flow when they can't use the client secret. 
So Pixie solves this problem of sending data over the front channel by essentially creating a new secret per request on the fly. And I'm not going to go into the details of how it works here, but I do have videos on YouTube on the Okta developer channel uh, that talk more about this in detail if you're curious. So after the Pixie was developed, there was another RFC published, which was specific recommendations for doing OAuth in mobile apps. And one of those, one of those recommendations is, of course, that, that mobile apps should use Pixie. And there's some other recommendations in there as well. So Pixie was created for mobile apps, but it's actually useful for any time that there's no client secret, which means single page apps can also use it now. And this is actually one of the specs I'm working on, which is recommendations for browser-based apps. And one of those, one of the recommendations in this spec is saying that browser-based apps or single page apps should also use Pixie because it solves, it, they have the same problem that mobile apps have. So why wasn't this a recommendation sooner? Well, what do these two browsers have in common? These browsers do not support cores, cross-origin resource sharing. Why is that important? Well, if you are writing a single page app, it's probably served on the app's domain and your token endpoint, the thing that's issuing access tokens, your OAuth server, very well might be on a different domain. And if it is, then you have to have uh, cross-origin resource sharing set up properly in order to actually make that API request across domains. Now, this is like obviously a widely supported thing now. Single page apps use this all the time for accessing various APIs and it's very normal. And it's very widely supported, of course, because it's just such a normal part of the modern web. So because it's available, it actually now makes sense to use it in OAuth as well. So with uh, cross-origin resource sharing, now browser-based apps, single-page apps can use Pixie, which means the implicit flow is basically no longer useful. And that was the only sort of remaining use of the implicit flow. And it was never a good idea to begin with. Everybody knew that. So let's now you know, officially take it out, right? So one of the recommendations, again, in the browser-based app spec is to avoid the implicit flow. It is you know, not useful anymore. There's a couple other things the spec says, which is various options you have for configuring um, your single page app, whether that's the single page app itself being the OAuth client and getting access tokens and making API requests directly, or putting it behind a application server, sort of a backend for the front end pattern, and using a HTTP only cookie between the browser and that application server. And these are the kinds of things that are going into this document. So then there's another document, which is the security best current practice. And this is an in-progress one still, it's not finalized. And this document basically encapsulates these recommendations and several others into this, this document that it describes sort of the most secure way to do things now. And one of the things that also does is takes out the password grant because again, that was never really the intention of, of it. But it also recommends using Pixie even for confidential clients because it also, it's not just that um, mobile apps can't use a client secret. There's this other problem of authorization code injection, which is a potential issue. And um, that's again, way, would take way too long to describe in this talk, but I do have several videos again on YouTube talking about it. Um, and it also says, well, okay, you know, passing access tokens and query strings was never a good idea either. Let's take that out. So the security BCP is basically trying to say, we know that there were some things in the original spec that weren't really a good idea, but they were sort of in there for some reason or another. Let's now officially take them out. So I want to talk about the password grant for a minute because this is actually a really important one. The security BCP is flat out taking this out. It's saying, just don't use a password grant. And you might be thinking, well, that seems awkward. How am I supposed to then like, you know, use use OAuth or in a, in a single page app or in a mobile app or something. Well, the password grant was never meant for how it's ended up being used. It's actually there because it was meant to be an upgrade path for apps that weren't doing OAuth and just storing passwords and using passwords at APIs, which is a horrible idea. And, you know, it is now, uh, it, it was intended to be an upgrade path to, to trade those passwords in for access tokens. So it was a migration plan. That's not, how it ended up being used. Um, if you are curious, though, passwords are a bad idea to to let apps hold passwords because it's you know exposing that password to the application, which even for first party or trusted apps is a risk. And it also trains users that it's okay to enter their password in random places, which is again not great. It's also impossible or 
difficult at best to extend this to support multi-factor auth or passwordless authentication. So it's really just not very flexible. It was never meant to, to be in there in the first place, really. So let's take it out. All right, so the security BCP is sort of the capturing the state of the art of what is the current best practice in OAuth. Basically, it says all OAuth clients must use Pixie with the authorization code flow, so no more implicit flow. Password grant, no more. Um, redirect URLs, they have to be exact match instead of sort of wildcard matching. There's some really tricky ways those can go wrong otherwise. Um, don't pass in access tokens and query strings anymore. And refresh tokens for public apps have to actually be uh, either sender constraint, which means adding some sort of key into it, or one-time use. Okay, but I will also caveat this. This is still in progress. This is not finalized. You can go to this link on the, in the slides to learn more details and also join in on the discussion. So that's sort of where we get to right now, which is, I would say, state-of-the-art, current um, best understand, understood recommendations for, doing, for, for building OAuth systems. There's a lot of in-progress work as well. And I want to just sort of give you a quick summary of a lot of the sort of current, current in-progress work. Um, JSON Web Tokens for access tokens. Many systems actually use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens. So there's a new document which describes if you are going to use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens, here's some recommendations for you. And it describes particular claims that go into it, particular ways of handling it, things like that. So it'll describe these keys and, and what these values are supposed to be and how to use them. Um, so that way, if you do have, if you do want to use JSON Web Tokens as access tokens, you now have a pattern to follow to do it securely. Uh, there's another one that is um, called Demonstration of Proof of Possession. And this one is basically a way to create sender constrained access tokens, but not doing it at the transport layer. So mutual TLS is another option where you kind of do it at the TLS layer. This is a way of doing it in your application layer. So you can see that there will be like an extra header added to an API request, which is uh, a way to sign this request with some key so that it's then associated with the access token that you get. Um, there's a couple of new extensions that are coming into the, into the group for the first time being discussed about. And these open up some really cool possibilities for interesting ways to um, interesting new UIs or new things that can be done. So rich authorization requests. There's this problem with OAuth scope, which is that it's actually pretty limited in what it can describe. Scope is, of course, how you would say, grant this application read-only access versus write access or access to your files in Google Drive. But that's actually pretty limited. It can't describe like fine-grained or, um, or detailed requests. So you might want to describe a request like this. This application would like to pay this merchant $123.50 from your account ending in blah, right? And then you want to authorize this one request. You don't want to grant this app permission to always pay this merchant arbitrary amounts. You want to say, I'm granting this specific request. So rich authorization request describes a syntax for actually describing the request the app is trying to make so that the authorization server can um, display that in a user interface. Push authorization requests is solving um, another problem, which is that the front channel is it's basically reducing reliance on the front channel. So normally when you start an OAuth flow, you build up the URL and then redirect the browser to that. That has the problem that um, things, you know, the user or other applications could modify that request that the app is making. So push authorization request instead initiates that request from the back channel. So instead of the URL that you would normally be building up to start the OAuth flow at the top, you instead first push that to the OAuth server, you get back a request URL and then you redirect them to that URL so that the user can't modify what's in that request. I think that's a really, I'm excited for this one because it's a lot more secure and it's not that much extra work to actually build. Uh, JSON Web Token Authorization re Requests, or JAR. This is the idea of, um, it, it's again a way to protect the request the app is making, but it's doing this in a way that also signs it so that the authorization server can actually prove the client made this request. So you would take, those request parameters again, and then put them into a JSON web token and then sign it and package that up. That can then either be passed by URL because it then can't be tampered with, or it could be pushed using push authorization requests. So at this point, okay, you're probably thinking that's a lot and there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of different RFCs and you're, you're right. Like it is a lot. It can feel like trying to get through a maze in order to actually find your way through this and figure out what you need to know and 
and where those things are. So one of the other initiatives in the group that I'm leading is actually to sort of consolidate a lot of these. So if we take a look at sort of what is the current widely regarded stable parts of OAuth 2, it's this picture, right? We've started with OAuth core, we've taken some things out, we've added some things, we've taken out some things of bearer tokens. And if you look at what's actually left, it's actually a lot simpler. It's actually a few grants and a few different ways of using tokens. And this is what we're trying to wrap up in this bundle called OAuth 2.1. So OAuth 2.1 is an attempt to sort of reset the baseline so that as a new as a newcomer, instead of starting from you know the, the documents from 2012 and reading all the way through till now, you're starting at sort of what's currently regarded as widely established and can then find the extensions you need after after that from there. So OAuth 2.1 is an attempt to consolidate the OAuth 2 specs, adding best practices, removing deprecated features capturing the best practices in OAuth under a single name, and also adding references to things that didn't exist when OAuth was first written. If you look at the original OAuth 2 document, there's a lot of places in there where it says, this is future work. We don't have a good solution for this yet. And now we do. We have a lot of these extensions. So it's, you know, now we can incorporate those and sort of guide people in the right direction to find the, the new work that actually is uh, working well. Some things that are not goals of OAuth 2.1, there is, it's explicitly not supposed to define new behaviors. So it's supposed to be just capturing existing behavior in a new, in a new spec. It's also not going to include anything that's experimental or in progress or not widely implemented. So the sort of summary of what's in it is um, OAuth 2 core, bearer tokens, Pixie, the native app and browser based app, best current practices, and the security best current practice. This, you can find more information at oauth.net slash 2.1. There's also, this is the link to the actual draft itself. And that is sort of where we're at with OAuth 2. The last thing I want to talk about is what's next. So you might have heard some, some mumblings about OAuth 3. And um, there is a new effort led by a very similar group of people, but under a different group which is to sort of, again, redefine everything. So there's two different proposals right now. There's a lot of discussions going on in this group. It's actually a new IETF working group. It's not being done in the OAuth working group, and it is explicitly not backwards compatible with OAuth 2. So OAuth 3 is meant to sort of do what OAuth 2 did for OAuth 1, which is throw out all the old stuff, take the parts that were good, the ideas that were good, but sort of reconfigure them and not get bogged down by being having to be backwards compatible. If you look at the, the current state of OAuth 2, a lot of those RFCs are sort of fixing holes, and they have to often do that in ways that um, are you know, less than ideal. Like you wouldn't necessarily go create a uh, protocol from scratch and have it turn out to be what OAuth 2 is right now. So OAuth 3 is meant to be a cleanup of all of that. And again, OAuth 3 is not the final name. Who knows what it's going to be called? But this is very much in progress right now. The, the group at the IETF is called GNAP, I think the G is supposed to be pronounced. I keep forgetting how that landed. They were, that was one of the very long mailing list threads. This is a very active discussion going on right now. Um, and uh, it, this is a good time to chime in if you have any interest in this as well. So with that, I want to thank you all for listening. And you can find more information at OAuth.WTF. My website is AaronPK.com. And I'm happy to answer any questions we have. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Aaron, very much. We do have a couple of questions here. Hopefully you can see those on the chat window. Maybe the, the first one, and I'm interested in this too, um, in the, the rich authorization request, maybe talk about a man in the middle attack. And I would actually, just to extend on this, I'd love to understand if there's maybe um, some guardrails or you know how people should think about using the rich authorization request. I agree that the need for better fine grade controls is great. So how should people think about using this? Yeah, so the idea with rich authorization requests is that, yeah, we're trying to describe you know detailed requests of, of dollar amounts or things like that. And yeah, there's definitely an opportunity there for bad actors to change dollar amounts or change bank account numbers. So one of the things that it does is it builds on some of those other those other works like pushed authorization requests, which means that that data about the request actually never makes it into the user's browser. It's all done on the back end, or it's um, signed as a JSON web token, 
so that you end up creating a JSON web token plus all the rich author authorization request vocabulary. So RAR ends up um, sort of describing the vocabulary or the or rather the syntax for how you describe that request, not the transport mechanism of that request. That makes a lot of sense for sure. Um, I, I love this controversial question that just came in. In your opinion, Aaron, do we need OAuth 3? That is a, that is a good question. Um, OAuth 2, like, it's not going away even after OAuth 3 or whatever that ends up being is a thing. OAuth 2 is not going anywhere. Uh, it's so widely deployed and it does work fine. Um, I would say that uh, there are some things about OAuth 2 that end up being um, well, so one example is there's nothing about identity in OAuth 2, right? OAuth, OAuth 2 says nothing about users or identities. It's always just about accessing APIs. So you need to add in OpenID Connect in order to do that. So one of the things that OAuth 3 might do is make it a lot easier to just sort of have identity baked in from the beginning, which, you know, you can solve it without that. You can solve it in OAuth 2. It just might be a little bit more complicated or more things to learn. So I think that if everything goes well, OAuth 3 will end up being a lot easier for people to start and engage with and use. Um, and maybe OAuth 2 will end up looking the way that SAML does now of like, it's sort of the complicated way that we can't get rid of because it's so widely deployed. So kind of a hand wavy answer, but I hope that's <laughs> That's fair. Um, I, uh, I think then one of the other questions here around best practice, what's um, best practice, secure ways to call an API from console for token generation is there's no user login like in the browser. Do you understand that? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways to answer this. If you are um, in a console and if there is a user involved in like setting that up, you do have a user involved in the flow and you should involve them and you should not be copying and pasting API keys around. And in order to accomplish that, you can either use the authorization code flow or the device flow, which is another extension I didn't mention, um, in order to actually establish that access token in that console app. Now, if you don't have a user involved and you sort of have machine-to-machine -machine accounts, the client credentials flow is what that's for. And that's actually been part of OAuth 2 since the very beginning as well. Um, and that's really what you use when there literally is no user, where, where the app is not acting on behalf of a user. <clears throat> Right. Um, okay, and maybe one final question then. Best practices for implementing OAuth 2 server via gRPC? Nice to tie back to our first session. I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that because I had zero <laughs> idea what gRPC is. <laughs> well, well, we'll park that one then um, okay. and, uh, and come back to it. Um, the... Uh, yeah, I think this this probably covers most of most of the question. Unless you see something else on that list that you'd like to to pick up on. Um, yeah, I'll talk about OIDC briefly. Um, so I, I didn't mention that in the talk at all because OIDC OpenID Connect is actually a completely separate working group from the OAuth group, and they have their own process and their own separate schedule and other extensions. Um, but that is a very they're very often used together because OpenID Connect adds in the identity part, which OAuth does not say anything about. So they're very often used together, and um, that is how the app will learn about the user. It's also, unfortunately, very easy to sort of misuse it and kind of uh, not quite understand how the two relate, which is one of the you know very often things people get confused about, which is what I try to help people understand, um, especially when access tokens are JSON web tokens, because then your access tokens and ID tokens look the same. Um, anyway, OpenID Connect is very much part of the ecosystem, though, and um, it'll also very likely be part of the OAuth 3 ecosystem in some way as well. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. Uh, well, thanks uh, for that, Aaron. I really appreciate it. This was a great talk, great summary of uh, the state of, uh, of OAuth for sure. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, next up uh, is actually going to be a video recording um, because our speaker is... Uh, uh, in Japan. And so hang tight um, for Nat Sakamura's um, discussion on self-sovereign identity. Um, we're going to be starting that um, in just a couple of seconds whilst we queue up the video. Hi guys, I'm Nat Sakamura, the chairman of the Open Lady Foundation. 
It's really unfortunate that I can't be with you live today. It's because it's like 3 a.m. at where I am in Tokyo. But rest assured, I'm going to upload this video onto my YouTube channel so that you can actually ask questions if you wanted to. Now, today, you're going to learn three things. One, my take on what is self-sovereign identity. And the second one is how self-issued OP, we call it PSYOP, copes with it. And number three, the next step. So, without further ado, let's get into it. What is self-sovereign identity? I will start with the easy part. Identity. In a community, it's defined as set of claims related to entity. In general, there are many identities per entity. Here, you need to remember two things. First, there are many identities mapping to an entity in general. A lot of people mistakenly think that there is only one identity per entity. That is false. The second often found mistake is to conflate identity and identifier. Identifier is a label that uniquely identifies the entity in the set of entities. So please be careful not to conflate them. Now, the hard part, self-sovereign. Sovereign, according to Merriam-Webster, is defined like this. Among them, what we mean by, in this context, is definition 1b, one that exercises supreme authority within a limited sphere. This limited sphere is the self. In other words, with self-sovereign identity, you should be able to keep having you recognized by a service that is you who are coming back and also select what claims are to be provided to the service. Now, that's harder than you may think. We identity professionals tend to categorize digital identities in three buckets. One, my identity, which exists without being given by either party and that I have fundamental control on it. Two, our identity, which usually is given by somebody else, but I can still use for my own purpose as well. An identity that is given by my employer or my Gmail address is a good example of it. In many cases, especially for consumer-facing identity, it's constructed as user-centric. You have the right to say how it should be used and so on. However, the fundamental right to the identity is on the organization and not on me. It may be taken away by the organization. Number three, the identity. It's the data about me, but I have no way to use it. My information in the company CRM system is an example. We cannot use the identity, so the choice is between my identity and our identity. But what if the identity you are using was our identity, the current mainstream identity? If they delete or ban your account, you will disappear from the internet and naturally your access to the service will be denied. To avoid that, I need to use my identity so that I can keep presenting me as me and the service can keep recognizing me as me as long as I want. It is an identity that will not be taken away, at least completely. It provides an ability for me to keep saying that it is me to the party I have a relationship with, without respect to what other party says. Typically, it can be achieved by letting the service recognize me using the public key I generated to verify that I hold a private key. This forms the baseline of a self-sovereign identity. However, this is not enough. 
to build a relationship with another entity. You often need to disclose some claims about you. That leads to the second requirements to the self-sovereign identity. Selective disclosure of self and third-party attested claims about me. It is needed to express ourselves without respect to what others say. But we have to accept the fact that we don't control all the information about ourselves. For example, the permission to drive a certain type of vehicle is not determined by myself, but it is determined by the authority. You cannot change it, although you may have some control over where these claims are presented and processed as authentic. At the same time, we want to minimize the claims that are going to be disclosed depending on the context. So, a self-sovereign identity system must allow selective disclosure of self and third-party attested claims about me. That actually extend to the past and the future. From time to time, we may want to express what we were in the past. For example, Alice may want to prove that she had a computer science degree from a university back in 2001. Then, suppose that her university got out of business because of COVID-19 crisis. How can Alice prove her degree in 2032 then? Or suppose there was a regime change in her country and her nationality was renounced. Now she is stateless. How can she prove that she was a citizen of that country before the regime change? The third requirement for self-sovereign identity is that the system must allow the subject to prove that the claims were tested at a certain point in time in the past. So, to summarize, self-sovereign identity system must allow the subject to be independently recognized by the party she has relationship with, disclose self on third-party attested claims about her selectively, and prove that the claims were tested at a certain point in time in the past. Now I'm coming to the second topic, how PSYOP copes with it. PSYOP stands for Self-Issued Open ID Provider. Open ID Connect is defined in a specification called Open ID Connect Core 1.0 and related specifications. And SIOP or PSYOP is actually defined in Chapter 7 of this specification. If you don't know, Open ID standards are used everywhere. Sign in with Apple, Google Sign in, Microsoft Sign in, GSMA Mobile Connect and so on are based on OpenID Connect and is estimated to be used by over 3 billion people. In addition, many countries and regions are using OpenID Connect in their citizen identity platform. Number of transactions are also large. As of last year, over 94% of Microsoft Azure sign-in are performed using OpenID Connect. OpenID FAPI, a new profile of it, is being used as the API access control standard by UK Open Banking and others that require higher level API protection. OpenID Connect, at its core, is Selective Claims Provision Protocol. When one of the claims are the proof of login, then the claim set can be used as federated login credential. But as you can see, it's not only the login information, it can carry arbitrary set of claims. That's why we call OpenID Connect an internet identity layer. OpenID Connect provider can be provided by a third party or you can provide it yourself. It can be on the cloud or on your local machine like your phone. The latter has a special name, Self-Issued OpenID Provider or PSYOP. There are 
capable actors that are involved in the entire framework. Obviously, me, the subject, is at the center, and I'll be using Authenticator to authenticate myself to the PSYOP. It can be just your phone, right? And then there's an IDP or OP program, OpenID provider application, which is running on your local machine like your phone or PC or Mac. And then there are claims provider. Claims provider is a party which can attest the claims about you. And finally, there's a line party at which you actually subscribe to the services. So these are the main actors of SIOP framework. If you look closely, there are two legs in it. Leg one is between the Rhine party and SIOP here. Yeah. And then leg two is between SIOP and claims provider. With this in mind, let's go into how things happens in SIOP framework. In the preparation phase, the first thing that happens is that SIOP gets registered to the dynamic or static claims provider. And then to bind your SIOP to the claims provider, you need to perform OpenID Connect authorization authentication. So the SIOP as a client sends OIDC authorization authentication request to the claims provider. When the claims provider asks you, do you like to authorize that access? And obviously, I would say, yeah, sure. But it will be granted. And as a result, access tokens and optionally refresh tokens are provided to my SIOP. That's the preparation phase. Now, in the usage phase, the client first asks the SIOP, who are you? And then I will issue a user info request with access token that I got in the previous phase to the client claims provider. Then the claims provider returns user info as a JWT job token. And that JWT will be included in the ID token that is going to be provided to the client. And when you look closely, there are a couple of problems that need to be solved. The issue number one is binding a sub in ID token in leg two to that of leg one, especially one in pairwise through the reverse ID identifier, PPID or ephemeral identifier is being used against the client. The jolt, which is provided by claims provider, actually has to have the PPID as UID in the token itself. Otherwise, the client cannot verify that the party, the entity that is identified in the ID token is the same person as that was described in the jolt within it. Second issue is the collection minimization. In the regular user info endpoint, there is no way to constrain the information that is going to be returned to the request. It will be okay to you know, filter them at SIOP if it wasn't assigned JWT. But in this case, because those values in JOT has to be verified by the client. The token is signed, and therefore, we cannot do the filtering at the SIOP level. So the token actually has been minted specifically for this particular request. To achieve that, we actually have to send a list of claims to the claims provider, and then claims provider mints the JOT that includes only what is being asked this time. 
Now, there is no specification that achieves this right now, and we are writing it as of today. So if you are interested in that kind of development, please come to the Open ID Connect working group and discuss. Now, once that's done, then the job, which is included in ID token, will only have what is being asked. So the collection minimization can be achieved. There are a bunch of to-do lists for PSYOPs. Here I have stated six of them. Registering the PSYOP to the claims pro provider so that PSYOP can request signed claims to the claims provider is kind of there, but it's not really well specified. And uh, most notably, there isn't any specification that talks about claims minimization or collection minimization. And uh, that needs to be done. And then binding the self-issued identifier, which is a hash of a public key, and the attested claim is, it's okay in the case of verinimous identifier, but when it comes to anonymous kind of identifier, it's actually not really well specified. And then we have no way of attesting the signing key from the past. And uh, in the case of PSYOP, we have no word at all about enabling of the key recovery. Also, we have nothing that specifies how to provide the claims to the right parties when the PSYOP is offline. There's another mode in Opera Connect, which is called distributed claims, in which case it can support the, the offline case, but that's not very well defined as well. And then finding the PSYOP address can become an issue. When we defined PSYOP, there was nothing like deep link, so we're using custom scheme. So for that, as long as there's only one app which is using the custom scheme, which is OpenID colon slash slash, the finding or discovery of PSYOP address became no issue. But with the reintroduction of deep links, it just came back. So these are the things which are not solved right now. We had SSI day uh, back in January 27th in Miyazaki, and it, like almost 30 people joined there, the, the workshop and hashed out what is the good pattern, what is not, what's, what is an anti-pattern, what could be requirements, so on and so forth. And taking those input, I've come up with uh, you know, basic protocol requirements. There are separate operational requirements, but this is just protocol requirement, and I have just listed 10 of them, like self-issued keys and subject identifier with rollover and recovery, IDP discovery, proper specification, which has to happen always, and consent if necessary. You know, Consent is not always necessary. It can be uh, processed with other legal basis as well. Then uh, also I have to point out that the consent is not always possible. In our lifetime, the period that we can actually give the real consent is at a pretty limited. And then collection minimization claims, you know, CP claims provider, rank party unlinkability, multiple trust claims providers, incentives for claims providers, choice of subject identifier, which can be short, short term, meaning it can even be ephemeral just one time or a short period of time or long time, like lifetime. And then PPID, which stands for pairwise pseudonymous identifier or sector specific identifier or omnidirectional identifier. And it's up to your choice. And then counselor kind of uh, entity has to be there. It's sometimes called in the legal sphere, the libertarian paternalism. And also, we need to be able to leverage the existing infrastructures as much as possible so that the Iran party has minimal things to adopt these protocols. And the, this is my evaluation of PSYOP against this requirement. Some are fulfilled quite well, some are not. We have to bring the specification up so that it will be fulfilling all of them. So last week, 
we had the first ever Saiyan virtual meetup. This is very well attended. The ticket just went like crazy. Within two hours or so, all the tickets were actually sold out. Over 100 people came along. That was actually almost everybody registered. And people from diverse background, like Decentralized Identity Foundation, Kantara Initiative, Microsoft, myself, but you know, various implementation came along and shared the problems. And in the end, we decided to you know work together to solve these problems as quickly as we can. So we are going to convene the workshops and also start working on those items in OpenID Connect working group. I think we are going to form a sub working group besides it because it's a big group now. So if you're interested in finding out what's happening and if you're interested in providing some inputs into these works, please come along and join the Open Media Foundation working groups. It doesn't cost anything. What you have to do is just to agree that you don't sue the implementations. Here are some additional information that you could actually use. So I'm really looking forward to meet you in our working group or some other venue. And thank you very much for joining this session. Excellent. Um, we will thank Nat Sakamura. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this session was pre-recorded. Uh, if you have questions for him, um, feel free to reach out on Twitter or LinkedIn or, or um, some other um, of the working groups that you might be involved in. Um, and uh, we'll be getting started with the next session in just a couple of minutes. So next up is Eve Mahler, the CTO of uh, Forge Rock. Um, she's going to be talking about consent. And, uh, and we'll be getting started with that um, in just about uh, 60 seconds or so. Hang tight. Eve, welcome. I'm here. Hopefully I'm doing everything right here. <laughs> yeah, everything looks great so far. So uh, that's awesome. Thanks for joining us. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, uh, I guess I'll just pass it straight to you to introduce yourself and your session. And just a reminder for the audience, if you have questions for Eve, we are going to take those at the end. Um, feel free to use the, the chat uh, window here, the session-specific chat window. Um, we'll curate those questions, and uh, I'll try and form them out to Eve um, at the end. Wonderful. Thanks. Am I sharing my screen correctly? Uh, you are, yes. Yay. I love when a thing comes together. Awesome. Well, thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks for joining. I'm excited to be back at API Days, in this case, Interface, uh, in this case, virtually. Um, I'm a CTO of Forge Rock. Uh, we help people safely and simply access the connected world. Um, it's a complex time in privacy. Uh, you know, with COVID-19, uh, we have people pulling back on implementing regulations, but we have people caring more about privacy with things like contact tracing. Um, so I thought I'd talk about uh, the nature of consent, uh, the nature of where it's going. We just heard from Nat about some ways to maybe implement it. Um, and I want to talk about uh, how we need to perhaps get beyond consent. Um, uh, what do I mean by democratizing data control? Um, this talk is about some research that I did uh, with Lisa Lavasher, with whom I do some standards, and uh, research that we published in an IEEE journal called, um, 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 uh, sorry, um, what is it called? Communication Standards, in fact. Um, so. If we take a look at the data protection and privacy legislation map worldwide, I've been tracking it um, uh, over the course of this year. Um, and before we kind of knew what was going to happen with certain pandemics, um, we had 58 countries with uh, actual legislation already passed, 10% of countries with draft legislation, 21 countries with no legislation at all. And things have actually progressed, even with 
kind of the slowdown, the COVID-19 slowdown. Um, and consent is actually a big principle uh, in all of this privacy legislation. Uh, and, and there's kind of a difference in, in the nature of, of consent when you look at, say, in the EU, uh, you see that there's, the, there's human rights basis to consent. In the US, it's a little bit different. Uh, it's, it's got a kind of a property principle, a property rights principle. And you see a difference between opt-in versus opt-out in how it's supposed to work. Nonetheless, consent is really, really important. We're supposed to do it. Uh, and then as a companion uh, to what's going on in the world, we have the kind of financial services world. We have the global, global open banking uh, phenomenon uh, starting in the UK open banking, uh, big O, big B, uh, and then spreading out from there all over the world. I think this map is probably even out of date now. Um, the open banking phenomenon has kind of three features. It has uh, secure customer authentication, so secure authentication. Um, so that's a, pri uh, a security feature. It has data portability, and it has consent. Um, so re uh, relevant to COVID-19, uh, you might want to know that in just the first month of the coronavirus lockdown, 6 million UK adults, that's 12% of the UK population, actually downloaded their bank's mobile app for the first time. And they may care about things like secure customer authentication and data portability and consent. Um, so a little bit more in a moment about open banking. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what consent means, what it means legally, and how well it's working. So about a little over a year ago, a legal scholar named Nancy Kim came out with a book called Consentability. I guess maybe a word she made up, consent and its limits. And she defined kind of uh, across the globe the three pillars of what you need legally for consent. And, and you won't be surprised that it needs manifestation, meaning kind of an act, a positive act to say that you, you consented. Uh, it needs knowledge. You need to know what you're consenting to. Uh, and it needs what, what lawyers will call voluntariness. So that, that means basically volition. You need to uh, kind of have a free, free will uh, in what you're doing. Now, there's context involved in how strongly you need to uh, uh, know, do all these things in, in terms of consenting to whether it's, uh, I don't know, uh, an act of surgery to, I don't know, you need, you need an arm removed or something like that versus uh, consenting online to, to share some personal data. But Nonetheless, we're, we're pretty aware of these kind of things. So, so my co-author and I looked at some typical patterns online of, of broader permissions to share personal data in a digital context. Um, so we found that there were six typical patterns. Um, first of all, we found that there are four patterns of really classical consent, cookie consent, permissions within an application to share consent, uh, share personal data, marketing preferences, and then third-party permissions. Now, cookie consent, obviously, we're all very aware of it. It's the first time we typically meet a website that we run into cookie consent. Um, and then third-party permissions are really important because that's kind of the OAuth pattern of how we do app connections. Um, so these are quite often opt-in, but most particularly, this is kind of a pull pattern, right? So we have a consent seeker and they want consent from a consenter. The fifth pattern that we saw was the terms of service agreement. I chose Stan Lee as my representation of the signature. So this is something that we, we run across when we maybe create an account or maybe the terms of service have changed. So we're asked to re-agree. Um, we see it with privacy policies as well. And this is meant to be kind of even Steven, you know, where there's an offer made and we're asked to accept it. And so it's meant to be kind of we're on an even footing. And then there's kind of a sixth weird and powerful pattern of permissions. And this is party to party sharing or delegation. And this is the share button. This is when, say, in Google Docs or um, in Dropbox or in TripIt or something like that, which I remember when we used to travel, um, you want to share some access to, say, a Google Docs document, but you choose not to give edit access, you choose to give just view access, something like that. And so this is really quite different. It's a push pattern. You're choosing with nobody potentially asking you how much to share, what to share, maybe when you want to take back the sharing. So these were the six patterns that we observed. 
Now, let's have some real talk here. Um, how well is most of these permissions really working? Um, lawyers actually call most of the consent out there defective, and we would call it broken. <laughs> Plainly and simply, uh, the acts or manifestations of consent, the knowledge, the voluntariness or volition, uh, we have apps spying on us, we have the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, we have abusive marketing preferences stuff, we have stuff sent to us we didn't agree to. Um, there was some great uh, research about the biggest lie on the internet um, where uh, there was a fake social network they put together um, and there was a terms of service agreement that should take 15 minutes to read um, and people were taking 51 seconds maybe on average to read it, um, totally missing the gotcha clauses in there about how I agree to share my data with the NSA and I agree to pay for the app with my firstborn children. So it's clearly not working. And, and this is in a context, okay, that research wasn't done uh, really before uh, in, ter in terms of uh, GDPR enforcement, but we've now had two years of GDPR enforcement. We've now had a good year of um, CCPA in the California um, privacy context. Um, and what's happening is, um, GDPR has, 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 you know, been with us. CCPA has been with us. CCPA is already trying to be fixed. They've got something on the ballot to try and fix CCPA and make it stronger. So um, what we see is out and out abuse. We've got a failure mode. We've got folks who are trying to not ask for consent. They're just doing the minimum. So this is an example of a dark pattern. So if you, if you follow dark patterns on Twitter and they've got a website, you'll see examples like this. So this is cookie consent here. If you take a quick look, what you're seeing is you can check any checkboxes you want or not check any cookie checkboxes you want. But at the bottom of the screen, if you do the obvious thing, what you're doing is select all cookies and confirm. And you have to notice that at the right, there's that confirm selection, which is the one that you actually really want. So you can figure out, depending on what jurisdiction you're in, whether this is legal or not. But what it is is it's not really a consent seeker and a consenter, and it's not consent, it's, it's deception. They're, they're a Decepticon, right? They just are. So what do we have to do to actually get to a non-dysfunctional relationship, a, a functional relationship? Um, we need to get to some kind of mutual agency and value exchange, let's call it. So, so Lisa Labasher, my, my uh, co-author and co-researcher, um, run something called the Me to the Alliance, in fact, and, and we're looking for something that can be mutual, can start with um, the notion of a, a Me to the relationship. And so what we developed was a set of criteria that you'd actually need to meet, because clearly the notion of consent is just it's not even working. So we developed these four criteria. An individual has to be able to assert the terms that they're interested in for sharing digital, their, their, their personal data. Um, they have to be able to specify those terms proactively prior to supplying any personal data, including any authentication data used in account setup if there is an account. So identity is just a tool that we use to develop digital relationships, really. Um, third, they have to have a choice about being remembered. That's, that's, that's what the identity tool is being used for. They have to be able to go to a site, for example, without any tracking at all. That's got to be their choice. And fourth, I mean, just the same way that terms of service agreements are, they're, they're part of an agreement, the terms have to be usable for the person and for the organization. Okay, plain and simple, you hope. So the idea is that we need to be thinking about life cycles of relationships, not just in terms of identity management, which has life cycles, but also in terms of relationship management with people involved as well. So this cataloging of permission types enabled us to do actually a legal analysis with some lawyers that we worked with. And we realized that the properties of consent with the consenter and the consent seeker, well, it sort of came up, no bueno. It didn't meet our criteria. Um, the contract relationship with the offer on the organization side, the acceptor, did not work very well either. But there is a special kind of contract called a license, which is an or if an individual is able to offer it to the organization in some fashion, it's a license kind of a special kind of contract, but it's really its own beast. And it could potentially meet the criteria if we could find some technology that could 
help us do that. And we actually found two technologies, at least, that could start to do that. So I wanted to share that with you. Um, the first is UK open banking, potentially, as a solution. So um, you don't have to really stare at the um, at these acronyms here at the top, but I've, I've expanded them. UK open banking, interest, interestingly, is not just regulations for greater security, privacy, data portability, and interoperability for the UK's nine largest banks and building societies. It's also technical standards that involve OAuth and OpenID Connect. Um, so the way it works is you're basically doing a special purpose version of third party permissions, the fourth kind of permissions we discovered. Um, and they've kind of used a special part of OpenID Connect to do this trick. So the way that it works is the third party payment app that you're using as, as a merchant app wants to let you pay through your, your bank account. So that's the, that's the um, PISP there. So it collects what it calls consent details, and, and I want you to get hung up on the terminologies, of what you intend to purchase. Let's say it's a bicycle for a certain amount of money. It collects that information. It calls that consent. Let's, let's not worry about it too much. It bundles those details, sends them ahead to the bank before you've actually logged into the bank and receives an intent ID. And then it redirects you to the bank with that ID and enables you to log in and then ultimately allows you to authorize what it calls authorize, confirm those details. And then that transaction will succeed assuming you have the money in your account to do it. So it kind of pushes ahead something before you've actually logged into your bank. And it sort of shows the green shoots of possibly being able to push ahead your preferences for what you'd like done with your data. It happens to push ahead some personal details of you, which UK Open Banking makes you do, but a generic solution in the direction of what we'd like to do maybe doesn't have to do. Um, so that's one green shoot. The second green shoot is user managed access, which is another standard that is also built on top of OAuth and OpenID Connect. Um, in full disclosure, I founded and still uh, chair the group that does uh, user managed access. Now this is a type of peer-to-peer -peer delegation where the, the kind of the OAuth resource owner role shares with an entirely other party. Um, it's, and it um, loosely couples the AS and the RS of OAuth, and it enables a central dashboard that you could manage who you shared with in sort of GDOC-like fashion. So it's applicable to financial services, it's applicable to healthcare, it's applicable to um, Internet of Things. I'd like to give you uh, a real life uh, healthcare example that you know I'm, I'm working with uh, somebody on. So let's say Atlas uses a health insurer as a sharing hub for three entirely different data sources that may not even come from the health insurer. Um, that sharing hub would be the authorization server. Bob currently has no relationship with Alice, but they get married. Alice would like to share a subset of that data with Bob due to their relationship. Maybe uh, the information about what prescriptions she gets and her fitness wearable data, but not uh, information about her benefit claims. Bob tries to access, let's say, her fitness wearable data that the health insurer has agreed to be the sharing hub for, even though it doesn't actually see any of that data. The sharing hub therefore allows the data access request on the basis of the fact that he's married to her. So that access attempt actually goes through. This is through basically OAuth access token access. Now, sadly, Alice divorces Bob, which in US health insurance terms is a qualifying life event. So she can do it anytime and that um, should be able to go through and, and happen at any time. And now the sharing hub needs to be able to end all relationship based sharing with Bob. And it needs to be able to prove that both to Alice who has an interest in needing to see this and to any auditors. 
So what does all this mean now? If these are sort of two green shoots about how we can meet these me to be criteria and life cycle management um, for both people and organizations, given that consent does not maybe have an endless future, what could you do about democratizing data control now? We've kind of got this pyramid of where privacy has been going. We kind of have this data protection and data privacy 1.0 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that looked like security of, of um, personal data, where data, where data subjects were kind of disempowered. Um, and then slowly the regulations have been adding more and more power for data subjects such that they were, um, organizations were required to give more data transparency. Oh yes, we hold this about you. Oh yes, we, pro we um, are, are going to hold, uh, ask for this about you because we're going to do this with the data about you. And they've been sort of, the regulations have been saying, well, you have to give a little bit more data control to data subjects, but data subject is even not a very empowering term. We're gonna have to start recognizing that people need more data control and deserve more data control and consent is working so badly that it may just fall over of its own weight. So start recognizing that if you're working inside an organization that is trying to implement this stuff, you do want a single view of the customer. You need to understand the kind of relationship that they want with you. First of all, they do want a single view of you and not you've got five domains and they deal with five domains. And they do want a relationship with you that they can start when they want and potentially end when they want not just because the regulations say so. Secondly, you want to be able to offer a really inclusive permission management dashboard across all of the apps and channels that you offer to them. Not just a consent management dashboard. This is something that we actually do. It's not just consent management. It's not just marketing preferences. It may also be delegation to other people, delegation to other parties. This is getting very popular in healthcare at the moment. Um, and then for people that you already recognize because they've engaged with you before, you really want to build express lanes that are absolutely secure, and this is possible today, uh, express lanes for how they get access to their stuff and engage with that stuff. And maybe they will share more with you on the basis of trusting you with it. So I'll conclude my remarks now and see if you have any questions for me. Let's take a look. Thanks, Eve. Yeah, um, I don't see too many questions. Maybe there's one here related to the financial data exchange and, and maybe yes. get some, some commentary on what they're doing with consent. Yeah, so I am aware. We, I actually have a colleague who um, sits in the financial data exchange and um, I know there's, there's a lot of work to do in the financial data exchange, but I know that they're inspired by UK open banking. Um, we, I also have some colleagues who are working in Australia with the consumer data right. And UK open banking has actually inspired a lot of those efforts in the same way that GDPR has actually inspired a lot of efforts. And I think that's actually good because there's kind of like, there's the semantic APIs, if you will, right? So that's like the read write APIs that are, they have to be jurisdiction specific a lot of the time. And then I'm hoping that we'll kind of have the security privacy identity stack that accompanies them that should start to look a lot more of the same, hopefully, um, because that will enable as much interoperability as possible. Because, you know, in financial services, you have a lot of cross-border data flows that you have to achieve. Um, and the more that consent can be, I'm not going to say implicit, I'm going to say abstract so that people can start to abstract what they've consented to so that it's more convenient. Um, I, I think that would be a good thing. Um, so yes, uh, please feel free to reach out on XNLGRRL on, on Twitter uh, if you want to discuss more. Um, David? Yeah. Um, maybe like you mentioned that uh, the sort of regulation or perhaps um, at least informing some of the, the work in, this, in, in the standards domain. Do you think regulation is, is ahead here? Is that really the driving force? Um, how's, how's that, how do you see that playing yeah. out? I mean, the reality is regulation is, uh, it's never super innovative. It tends to be behind the curve, right? And companies will tend to 
do only as much as they need to. But I have talked to a number of companies that are, are really surprisingly innovative. So, you know, there's some folks in Singapore that I've talked to where there hasn't till really recently um, been, oh yeah, I, I am sharing my whole screen. Uh, maybe I will stop sharing my screen. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there, so folks in Singapore that I've talked to who are really innovative and who have been looking ahead to either a huge, um, uh, a coming regulatory re regime or have wanted to um, be innovative around um, that, that data control equation, right? So something that uh, humanitarians have said for a long time, folks who are involved in UMA <laughs> have said is, um, it's well known that privacy is not Encryption, <laughs> you know, that's that can't be the be all and end all. Privacy is not secrecy because if you don't share anything at all, well, you haven't accomplished anything, right? Um, so we like to say that privacy is context, control, choice, and respect, all four things together. So you can tell that that it's not entirely a technical equation; it is partly a relationship equation. It's partly relationship management, and so. That's a tough thing for companies to do, um, but the best companies do it really well, and they tend to win the day. So if you have a low privacy maturity, um, you, at the margin, you tend not to do as well. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, uh, thank you, Eve. I really appreciate you taking time. This has been fantastic. Um, definitely for the audience, if you have any other questions that spring to mind, reach out to Eve on, uh, on Twitter or, or anywhere else. And, uh, and I'm sure she'll be keen to continue the conversation. Um, next up, uh, we have Dick Hart. Um, I'm sure everybody will be keen, the creator of OAuth, to, to hear Dick speak. Um, so, uh, yeah, we'll be welcoming him in just a couple of minutes. And thanks again, Eve. We really appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> Dick, welcome. Thank you. Um, yes, so we are we're trying to keep everything running on, on schedule here. It looks like we're doing a good job so far. Um, Dick's going to be talking about the future of OWASP. So this is going to be super interesting. Just a reminder for everybody that's... Uh, that's on. Uh, that's connected to this session. If you have, if you have questions, we're going to be um, trying to service some of those questions uh, at the end of Dick's presentation. Um, this is the last of the sessions in the uh, identity and security track, and um, so we'll be breaking for a um, for a lunch break um, right after this. Um, so uh, thanks everybody for for staying engaged, and and uh, I'll pass it over to you now to uh, to talk to us about the the future of OAuth. Okay, I think I still have a minute before I'm supposed to start. Um, is my oh the screen didn't share? Why not? Ah. Entire screen application window. Mm. Let's try that. And it doesn't like to grab it from my other screen. No, apparently. Hmm. Well, let's see. Move it over there. See if you can figure it out now. The, the fun part of this is, even if this was a real life conference, we'd be suffering the same problems a number of times. You know, when you come up and swap laptops on the podium, this is exactly yeah. the same battle we go through there too. Yeah. Well, I've gotten really good at that. <laughs> um, when I click on share screen, 
um, when I go to the application window, none of the other ones show what the what's in the window. Like they're just blank. Hmm. I wonder if uh, anybody from the API Days crew is uh, is online could offer some support. Yeah, hi. Perhaps, perhaps uh, if if you can't share your your screen, perhaps you you, you should. Uh, Send us the the presentation, so we'll share it for you. I don't know why, why it's not working. Okay. So maybe I'm gonna try. I'm in Edge. Maybe I'll go into. Oh, that's why perhaps. Yeah, better better to go on Chrome. Okay. Yeah, I found Chrome to be the most reliable this morning when we were getting started. And, and okay. if it doesn't work, uh, perhaps you can send your presentation to Ross, and yeah. uh, we'll share it for you. Mm -hmm. Mm, okay. Da, da, da. Okay. And we'll try this again. There we go. Great success. Woohoo. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> pass the floor to you then, and uh, we look forward to it. Thanks, Dick. Okay. So, I'm Dick Hart. I'm going to talk about uh, the future of, well, I'm going to talk about TX Auth, which I think is part of what the future of OAuth is. And so, some people may be thinking, is this OAuth 3? Um, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I'll talk about that at the end of my talk. So um, Dick Hart, my Twitter handle at Dick Hart, if you want to follow that. Every once in a while, I tweet something I find interesting in the security and identity space. Um, I was listed as a creator of OAuth. I don't know that I would claim that I'm, well, for sure I know. I'm, I don't think I'm the, the creator of OAuth. There's a lot of people involved. I just happen to be in the right place at the right time for some of the stuff that was going on. Um, if you don't know, there's a talk I did 15 years ago around Identity 2.0 um, that became fairly popular, partly from the topic and partly just from the presentation style. So if you haven't seen that, I think actually a lot of the concepts in that around user-centered identity, unfortunately, a lot of those are still really relevant these days. Um, I helped form the OpenID Foundation, the first version of OpenID. I worked at Microsoft for a while when I was there. I helped create what became OAuth 2 and JSON Web Tokens. Worked at Amazon most recently, worked with NAWS and then Alexa. And right now I'm working on a new venture called signin.org. I was most recently the co-chair of both the SEC event working group and co-chair of the TX Auth Both of which I'm, uh, well, the SEC event working group is finished and then the TX Auth because I'm working on one of the Specs, I've uh, stepped down as a chair so that I don't have a conflict of interest. But I'm pretty familiar with this stuff. So TX Auth, sit for Transactional Authorization. But it was a little confusing to people as to what we meant by transactional, right? Is it, a, is it authorization for a transaction? Is the authorization itself transactional? So we went through a big process on the mail list and we've uh, renamed it uh, GNAP, which is how I pronounce it. We had some discussion on, was it NAP, GNAP, GNAP? I'm going to go with GNAP for Grant Negotiation Authorization Protocol. Um, before we get into that, let's go a little bit of history on OAuth. Um, now we really started off with, how do we get access to APIs without people providing their usernames and passwords? And so a lot of that accumulated in a, in a standard called OAuth 1. Um, and then there was a little issue with that. And so there's 1OA is what people were encouraged to deploy. Um, and one of the design criteria in that was that they didn't want to have to require HTTPS, um, which meant that it was doing its own crypto. And that own crypto became a real challenge. That's the first issue I've got listed here. 
Myself, I ran into that one time. I was coding against uh, Twitter, which at the time was still supporting OAuth 1. And I had mistakenly left the S out of the URL, so it was HTTP, but Twitter sometimes would redirect to the right one, but when it would redirect, it would then have an HTTPS, which was a different URL, and it would fail. And sometimes it would actually go through and succeed. And so I had this intermittent bug that sometimes it would fail and sometimes it would work because sometimes the signature matched and sometimes it didn't. Uh, other issues around OAuth 1 were, you know, it was really set up just for web apps and there's a lot of other uh, scenarios. And then we had a real tight coupling between the AS and the uh, protected resource, what we often call the resource server now, um, which had challenges both in enterprise and in large scale deployments. So I got together with a few other people, Alan Tom from Yahoo, Brian Eaton from Google, my colleague, uh, your own from Microsoft, and I cat herded them to coming up something that eventually became OAuth Wrap, a little fun name history. We thought at first we just called it simple OAuth because we just took out the crypto. It was just like a simple version of OAuth. The OAuth people said, no, 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 you can't use OAuth in your name unless you're building on copying and, and extending OAuth. So we called it simple auth, and I forget why, but that was a problematic name. And then I came up with, what about RAP, Web Resource Authorization Protocol? Um, my co-authors all like that. We gave a presentation on RAP at one of the Internet Identity Workshops. It was just jam-packed with everybody, and people loved it. And then all the OAuth people started to freak out a bit that we were potentially diverging, and so they wanted us to call it OAuth RAP. And so we did, and um, I presented that spec at the IETF, the, at the OAuth working group. So the IETF had started OAuth working group to do 1.0 work and then was trying to figure out how to advance that. We presented RAP and that became the basis for what became OAuth 2. And I don't know if you, you'd have to click into this, but here's all the approved standards now in the OAuth working group. And there's a number of other things still in fly. So lots of work has happened. Lots of standardization has happened around that. Um, and then, of course, there's OpenID Connect, um, all the standards around from OpenID Foundation building on top of OAuth. I think Aaron earlier today talked about OAuth 2.1, which is there's Aaron's nice picture, the picture you wanted me to have of him. Hi, Aaron. Um, and in that, I stole the slide from him which was a, uh, you know, all the issues with OAuth 2. So a number of things that are in the standards have been said, don't do that. And there's a number of new best practices and other RFCs. And so it was really confusing to people as to what should they implement. And so 2.1 is really just capturing all of that. And I have the pleasure of uh, working with Aaron and Torsten on authoring that document, which we hope to be accepted by the working group really soon. Um, but there's issues around OAuth too, right? So one of them is the front channel security. Uh, I don't know. I'm seeing an OAuth 2 2.1 issue slide. Maybe it's just you, Kevin. I like that I can see questions at the same time. Um, so the front channel security, uh, Pixie helps all that, but it makes it more complicated to implement everything. Uh, you can only send so much data over a URL redirect, you know, and it's all name value pairs. Uh, PAR, the push authorization request, helps solve that. And then RAR, you know, has sort of a richer format for what the request can be. You know, but you're bolting on something that wasn't designed in. There's a bunch of different endpoints, which has turned out to be um, more of a challenge. Um, you know, you're having to figure out all these different things. And so every time... We add a new big chunk of functionality. We um, end up having to create a brand new endpoint because it wasn't really designed as a protocol uh, API endpoint. And then there's the challenges around authenticating dynamic and public clients. You know, public clients don't have a secret. There's a dynamic client registration, but it's not really that well deployed and it's you know challenging to implement. And then even for the pre-registered clients or confidential clients, you have shared secrets, which of course 
if you're sharing something, it's not very secret. And you know, in big deployments, when you have a bunch of different clients, you know, you have lots of challenges around how do you keep those secret. And the other challenge with that is that at the AS, right, it needs, treats a whole AS as a block of trust, and that everything in the AS is having to trust whatever verified the secret. And then the last issue is, you know. OAuth was designed for authorization, not authentication, but people started using it for that, which is what drove the creation of OpenID Connect, which was really a standardization of Facebook Connect. Um, and it was bolted on, so there's some challenges around that. So um, there's two drafts that might be the starting point of the GNAC work, or we may create a new one. There's the XYZ draft that uh, Justin wrote and there were some aspects of that that I was at first partly confused of, which I've aligned on just on its own, but there's some other aspects that I think are complicated. So it's a draft I wrote called XOF. So in this talk, I'm going to talk using some of the terms in XOF, um, just as an FYI. So let's go back and review the web server flow in OAuth 2. We've got a client, we've got a resource server, an authorization server, a user. The user is a resource owner of the stuff at the resource, and they would like to let the client access stuff at the resource server. And the user has delegated the authorization server to delegate that authorization to the client. So our flow starts off with the request as a redirect flow over to the AS. All the information about what's being requested is in that redirect. The AS, of course, at this time still doesn't really know who the client is. The only strong hint is the redirect URL that's going on, and of course the client ID, but it hasn't verified who the client really is. The AS, of course, goes through, then uh, authenticates the user, gets consent from the user for returning the result, and then sends the code back representing the authorization. And then the client exchanges that code for an access token and a refresh token, and then calls the resource server with uh, that access token. So in GNAP, we have the same actors, um, but instead of doing starting the flow off with a redirect through the user, the client makes a request directly to the AS. It authenticates in that request. That request can be much richer, and it gets back some information. And in this web server flow, the AS says, yeah, I need to interact with the client. And so that request has a bunch of different things. You know, the client can say stuff about it. It can say something about the user it thinks it's interacting with or knows it's interacting with. It says, here's the kind of interactions that I support. Here's the authorizations I would like. And here's the claims I would like. So obviously, some of these are optional, depending on what the client is wanting. But we have a place for you know each type of information about what's happening. So the next thing is that the client redirects the user over to AS, but now instead of that being an API call, it's really more of transferring control from the client over to the AS. And that URI that the client is sending to the AS, the AS minted that on the request, and so it's a request-specific URI that the client didn't even know beforehand. Um, the client, the AS does the same thing it did. So from a user experience point of view, it's going to be exactly the same as OAuth today, except that you know, from a protocol point of view, there's no code in there. And the client then goes and makes a call to say, okay, you know, I'd like to get what the user authorized, gets it back, and then the client can make a API call just like it makes an API call today with OAuth. So we've really we've changed the flow and how the client and the AS are interacting, but the user experience and the interaction with the resource servers are the same. So let's look at review the OAuth 2 issues and how we've addressed them here. So the first two were around front channel security and the constrained request. Right, starting off in the back channel allows us to have a much richer request. Right away, the AS knows who the client is and what's going to happen. Um, you know, we have a much richer request that we can send over. And of course, we're, our redirect flow now is really just transferring the interaction between the user, you know, between the client and the AS and back. You know, there's still some things that need to happen to make sure we don't have a session fixation that 
the client knows that it's still it's dealing with the same user that the AS is using and vice versa. The next issue in OAuth 2 is the multiple endpoints. And so in the GNAP URLs, there's the one endpoint, the grant server URI, which you know, I'm viewing as a, the GS identifier. And all the other URIs are dynamic, right? So the interaction URIs, there's a URI the client says, here's where I want you to redirect me back to, which is unique to the request. And similarly, the URI the uh, GS provides is unique to the request. And then in uh, the XAuth protocol, I also have URIs representing the grant and representing the authorization server. Um, and sorry, Kevin. Um, uh, uh, yes, Patrick. I'll just kind of answer some questions on the fly because I can. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit more detail later on. Um, so the grant URIs and authorization URIs are very restful. Same with the uh, grant server URI. So you're doing a post to the grant server URI, you get back, uh, you know, essentially the grant URI, you can do a get on that, a delete on that, a put if you want to modify it. And then uh, you also get authorization URIs for each access. And when you, a refresh is really just another get on that URI. Um, oh, other issues in OAuth 2, you know, authenticating dynamic public clients, shared secrets. In GNAP, the default is to use asymmetric crypto instead of shared secrets. And so each registered client can have its own, you know, private key, you know, having a cert from its uh, master that enables the AS to know, oh, I, I can trust this particular instance of a client. You're not having to go and distribute secrets around. And then dy dynamic clients mint their own key pair, call the AS, the AS will return them back a handle that they can use on subsequent calls and know it's the same instance. And then the trust is really on the first use from the user saying, yeah, I trust this particular instance. And then the last issue wasn't designed for auth end. So right away we're baking into uh, the request that the uh, client can ask for claims. So some other new features, um, there's extension points. And so rather than reinventing or saying, here's our schema for claims, here's our schema for asking for authorization, uh, the antenna GNAP is to go and support different schemas. And so as people have different ways of describing claims or requests for authorization, uh, GNAP can just use those. And then we can also support new interaction modes as to how does the client get the user over to the AS and back. And then some additional new features, um, I've written those up in the advanced features draft that I did. Um, one of them is in the core, which is multiple authorizations that you can ask for more than one thing as opposed to just one access to one thing. Um, reciprocal grant. So at times, both parties are both a client and a, a authorization server resource. And so I came across this when I was working on Alexa, where Alexa would want to be able to call Spotify, and Spotify would want to be able to call Alexa, both in the same context of the user. Setting that up with OAuth is really complex because you go through one flow, and then you need to send the user back to the other side to start the flow. With GNAP, it's it's really easy to make this happen. Um, GS initiated grants, so sometimes you have to provide her, and that's where the user start and wants to go and do something at the client. And so you could just have that happen. That doesn't work very well. It's complicated. You know, essentially you're having to do some other redirects back and forth to make that happen with OAuth and OpenID Connect. Connect. And of course, back channel, you can do some discovery. You know, do you have this user, or this is what I think about this user, and depending on what the AS says, if they want to, that's a policy decision, the client can decide what kind of experience they want to provide, right? So if the user has an account at the GS, they can provide one experience, and if the user doesn't have an account, they can show, hey, you know, you're going to need to create a new account over there. And those are, you know, two different types of experiences. And then the last one here is, um, you know, sort of future oriented, but you can see it happening where 
you know, if you're authorizing a number of different pieces of information, you may want to have multiple consent screens at the GS for the client. And so the first consent might be something that includes where you live. And then depending on where you live, there may be different things that the client needs to ask for. But since we've started the protocol up with a back channel between the client and the server, that as the user answers questions, the GS can send that answer down to the client and the client can say, okay, well, this is what I want next or I'm done. And the GS can then prompt the user for whatever's next or send them back to the client. Uh, if you're interested, the mailing list, because once the mailing list is created at IITF, they don't change it. So the mailing list continues to be called TXOff. And the draft charter, which I think went through IESG approval and is now on to the last comments, is at that URL. So I promised at the end I'd talk about sort of is this OAuth 3. Um, well, it'll obviously be up to the community as to what do we call that, but I think that calling it OAuth 3 is going to be a bit of a misnomer because, you know, it's also got all the functionality of OpenID Connect. And so having it have a, a new name, I think, makes sense. And so I think an app is a good name. And here's a little screenshot from some people finding out how do you say an app, which is how the Smurfs pronounce an app for the purple Smurfs. Um, so that's the end of my talk. Um, open to other questions. I'll uh, dig into Patrick's question about uh, being able to just go back and forth. Yes, the plan can just call the, the GS and get something back right away. That was sort of possible in OAuth 2, but there wasn't really any easy way to provide any other parameters about what you're looking for, where in GNAP, you can say, hey, I've got this ID token for this user. Here's all the things I, I want. And the GS can say, oh, OK, I can see you really have worked with that user recently. And I've already got consent for that. And so I'm going to give you these answers. Uh, or I could say, yeah, I'm not even going to give that to you. Um, and the client then doesn't even have to bother uh, providing an interface to the user, right? Where Today, right, you're having to send the user over to the AS all the time, even if they're not going to give that. Uh, the IDP implementations. Um, Justin wrote an implementation for XYZ, and I'm in the middle of writing up a proof of concept for uh, XAuth. If you go to my GitHub, it's which is, you know, was almost every other idea I have on the internet, Dick Hart. Um, you'll see a TX off POC repo you can follow that I'll, you know, hopefully within a week be pushing out a node implementation of um, TX off. This is kind of fun, these questions. <clears throat> yeah. Um, anything else, uh, folks? Any other questions? Did you have any questions, Ross? Uh, I, I don't. Uh, this was really awesome. Um, yeah, best practice. Another another uh, request for best practices with gRPC. <laughs> <laughs> Ask Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> um, how is how is the XY implementation? Um, you know, I I go look at that. Right, some of the areas I disagree are is uh, Justin had a view, and I think, you know, when you step back philosophically, it, it makes a lot of sense to have handles for everything, and so he wanted to be consistent that everything could have a handle, a handle for the user, a handle for the client, or a handle for the key for the client, a handle for the transaction. Um, I moved towards having a URI, which, you know, has an identifier in it, but then, you know, it represents a resource, which enables you to have a much more RESTful interface. And so in his implementation, there's one endpoint and everything goes to that endpoint, which means you're having to parse JSON to figure out what the client wants to do, where if you have different URIs and different methods, your router can actually be decomposed, which in large scale situations, which I worked on at Amazon, you want different kinds of functionality at different services with different teams working on it, 
which enables you to have you know a lot more um, uh, much better security because you're minimizing what each group can do. Where you know a monolith like all OAuth now OAuth two, right? You got that one shared secret, and everything else has to trust that thing in the front end. Where in GNAP, if you've got a signed request, you really can just have a router routing it without having to check anything, or if it's checking anything, it's just to make sure it's on an error. But the endpoint can go and check to say, like, well, who really sent this? And know it really was that particular client asking for it, and then do that work. Excellent. Well, um, thanks, Nick. I really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. And if there are other questions, folks, um, reach out to Dick. Um, he'll, I'm sure, be keen to help you on Twitter or somewhere else. Okay. Thank you, Ross. Thank you. Just a reminder then, there's about a 20-minute break but, uh, between this session or this track and the next one starting. Um, so go grab some lunch uh, or um, be sure to check out um, some of the um, sponsors over in the expo section um, of the, the Hop-In app. Um, we'll be back here um, kicking off at um, uh, 12.20 um, Pacific Time. Um, the next session that I'll be moderating is API governance. We'll be kick kicking off with uh, Matthew Reinbold um, talking about APIs, arrangements of power, now what? Um, so API governance back here in this track um, right after the lunch break. See everybody in about 20 minutes. Thank you.